All right, folks, we're going to get started here. Is, this is on, yeah? Okay. Thank you, friends. We're going to get started now. If we can have your attention up here, please. Um, welcome to the first meeting of Anarchists Anonymous. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know what you're here for, but I'm here for uh, part two of a series called Revolutionary Nonviolence? Question um, mark. And you may have heard that this series is about exploring strategy broadly and strategy for Occupy and Beyond in particular. Um, the goal is really for us all to develop in our understanding of strategy and not to find the one right way going forward, but for us all hopefully to find some common ground so that we can uh, create a revolution. Um, and so we'll see what comes out of the series. Um, this, as I mentioned, is session two last week. Uh, we're pretty excited that last week started as well as it did with um, a, a showing of this is what democracy looks like, about <coughs> WTO actions in Seattle 99, and David Solnit joined us via video conference. Um, most of, well, actually all of his talk is available online, so it's really worth watching. He talks about the lessons from Seattle and beyond. Um, so before we, we kick into this evening, and I invite our moderator here to introduce the panelists, um, there, are, there are three quick things I want to say about the series. One is um, what will be happening over the next couple of weeks. Probably most of you have seen the flyers that are out there. Um, next week, rather than a panel, we have six storytellers who will be sharing stories about um, various strategic movements for social change. And there's a real diversity of movements represented in terms of geography, issue, etc. And this is really in keeping with one of David Solnit's um, strategy points last week, which is to tell our stories. Um, so next week is a story session. Um, the following week, actually, the Saturday the 10th, we'll be doing an all-day training called the Nonviolent Warrior Training here at Friends Center. Um, and a bunch of people are enrolled for that. There are still some spaces. And so I want you to rest assured that you don't have to be a card-carrying pacifist to take part in the nonviolent warrior training. It's an opportunity for, again, people to hone the strategies and tools of nonviolent campaigns for social change. Um, and you can apply for that online. Um, and then the third thing that I wanted to say is um, Based on the resonance of the series thus far and the kind of energy and, that we're seeing about and the expressed need, we're already starting to talk about a phase two of a more long-running series about vision, strategy, planning, action. Um, and so uh, there will be a call out going out to various organizations, including Occupy, working groups, et cetera, to start coming together and thinking about what the needs are and what kind of long-running series um, would be most helpful. All right. So I'd like to invite up our, our moderator for the evening. Um, many of you probably know Alex Knight. Alex is a teacher and an organizer, an activist who's been involved with Occupy from the get-go as a facilitator. He's finishing, uh, he's working on a book called The End of Capitalism, and we asked him here tonight because we thought he could keep people from coming to blows. So thank you. <laughs> Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yep. yep. Is this working? Oh. Yes. Yes. Lift it up. Lift it up. Uh, you can probably hear me anyway, right? Yeah. I think okay. the recording is though, Alex, so <coughs> louder. I'm tall. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My name's Alex Knight, and uh, I'm really excited to be here because I think Occupy Philly and probably the Occupy movement as a whole sort of stands at a crossroads and is sort of trying to figure itself out and trying to figure out, you know, what's the best way for us to make change moving forwards. So I think this is going to be a really productive discussion because we have, you know, panelists from very different perspectives, and I think it's going to be a very diverse and interesting conversation. Basically what we're going to do is we're going to have each of the four panelists come up and give a 10, like 10 to 15 minute um, presentation or just introduction to their perspective. Um, I'm going to be very vigilant about the time um, and I will cut people off if they hit 15 minutes because I want to make sure we have plenty of time 
to discuss as a, as a group, you know, with everyone. Um, so try to aim for 10 minutes if you can. Um, so I'm going to, uh, so the four people that we have tonight, um, not in the order that they're speaking, is George Lakey, um, who'll be speaking from a perspective of strategy for a living revolution. Um, Kathy Berry Green, who'll be speaking from a perspective of diversity of tactics. Um, Donna Jones, who'll be speaking from a perspective of faith-based nonviolent direct action. And Derek Jensen, who'll be speaking from a perspective of uh, deep green resistance. Um, and the first person who's going to come up is Kathy. Um, Kathy Berry Green has been doing nonviolent direct action for over 25 years with such organizations as Earth First, Students for a Free Tibet, um, anti-nuclear work, and also as a trainer for the Ruckus Society. Um, she's taught his, uh, history in the inner city from a radical perspective or point of view. Um, she's been active with facilitation working group in Occupy. Um, she's a pro professional photographer, and she's really cool. So here's <laughs> Going second. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so wow, nothing. No, no. If I move over here, can we still hear me on this? No. 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 Okay. So I feel like nothing like the loaded diversity of tactics discussion um, is come down on my head. I'm really actually excited about that because the way I look at it is the whole realm of diversity of tactics is way bigger than this like property destruction versus not property destruction, violence versus nonviolence. Um, like Alex said in my introduction, I have been a trainer with the Ruckus Society for many years. I specialize in blockade trainings. I've been a long-term Earth Firster with the belief in deep ecology. And I also have been really instrumental at the beginning part of Occupy with a lot of the facilitation for a lot of my life and work kind of pulled me into a bunch of different directions. And one of the things that I keep hearing people talk about is what people are standing for and what they believe in and what is nonviolence, what is our strategy. And so the first thing I want to say is I don't speak for anybody or any other organization, um, even groups that I've worked with, I just represent myself. And Working with stuff with uh, direct action for 25 years, I've done a lot of different kinds of actions. Um, and I always say that I believe in nonviolent civil disobedience. I don't just say I believe in nonviolence because that's kind of, um, I actually know David Solnit and I worked as well on organizing stuff for Seattle. And one of the things that he talks about is that nonviolence comes from this, like, just negative, what you're against. And I always believe in nonviolent civil disobedience. But that does not mean that the whole, uh, no, no, the whole philosophy that I stand by is always just a belief in nonviolence. And I feel that for transparency's sake, that's really important for people to know. I do support groups like the Zapatistas. I do support groups like the Plowshares who do property destruction. I do believe in monkey wrenching as an earth firster. I have supported in the past Earth Liberation Front, the Animal Liberation Front. I fully believe in a various huge diversity of tactics. As a blockade instructor or you know trainer, I get the the office, I get the whole kind of concept that a lot of times people get when people think that you're too radical. Um, sometimes you do protests and people think that my you know lock boxes and my 1,500 pound barrels of cement are really scary and that that's going to you know bring things to a different level. And it does bring things to a different level because I do believe that there are many ways to protest and many ways to be effective. Um, and I believe that everybody has their right to do what where they are, to be where they are in their own point of view. This is really hard for me to talk into that thing. Um, and so as a blockade trainer, I've had a lot of negativity thrown at me because I've said, people have said I've been too disruptive to their protest. Um, or, you know, they we're not having the same kind of goals, or this isn't safe for people to all come out to because the police are going to show up. And so one of the things that I really invite everybody in this room to kind of go inside yourself and just kind of have this belief that everybody's tactics are their own tactics. And you can't speak for what somebody else's tactics are or aren't. And that's on both sides. Because, you know, people have this huge economy between liberal and radical. And like I say in my blockade trains, and I did one here, I talk about radical means from the root. So it's where you stand from. And 
somebody that may have written their first letter to the government as a protest is pretty radical in their mindset. Somebody who, you know, may stand in, you know, southern Mexico with the Zapatistas, that's radical in their mindset. And so it all depends on where you are and where you're coming from. And one of the things I really hope that we can come out of this and ongoing discussions is just this kind of belief that we all have a respect for each other and what each other is doing and how they feel. Um, so as an Earth Firster, I don't know, how many of you are familiar with Earth First? So, you know, this guy by the name of, you know, Abby wrote this little book called The Monkey Wrench Gang, and, you know, it all kind of went from there. And Earth First started out as a pretty male-dominated, you know, organization. And I was one of the first pretty, you know, pretty outspoken, really radical women that had joined Earth First. Um, and, you know, there was definitely this lot of clash of where people were coming from. And one of the things that, you know, we're supposed to talk about is our own experiences. Well, some of my experiences I'm just not going to stand up here in a public forum and speak about. Um, and I hope people understand that um, and understand why. And one of the things that I do want to talk about, though, under diversity of tactics is strategic use of diversity of tactics. So I wrote some notes. <laughs> okay. So, excuse my, my reading. Um, so, as I said, I believe that the diversity of tactics is a really loaded statement. It means many things to different people. And I'm not against a diversity of tactics on all different kinds of levels. I'm against unstrategic use of diversity of tactics, things that are not meant to move something forward. Um, I want a true revolution. And I truly want to build a place where people can all come together. And I realize that not everybody is on the same wavelength and on the same level. And if you did a spectrogram, even in this room, of like what diversity tactics A even meant and what your beliefs are when it came to diversity of tactics, so we'd be all over the place. And I think that's really cool. I think that's one of our greatest strengths. And that was what made uh, Seattle so successful. What didn't make Seattle so successful, in my eye, was a bunch of Starbucks windows that got broken. Not my choice, right? Not where I would have stood not what I wanted to do. The reason I didn't stand behind that in that case was because I was in charge of the blockade. I was in charge of people who had their arms locked into 1,500 pounds of cement and couldn't get up and run away when the police came. And that, to me, is the mindset. That's the strategy. That's the, what are your actions doing that is affecting everybody else that's around you. That's the also where I look at where issues like race, um, gender, LGBTQ, certain people are at greater risks for having a greater repression. And when you have various tactics that aren't thought out and aren't kind of like the mindset of the group as a whole, then you're putting different people at risk at different levels. And they may not have invited that risk. And I fully believe that people always should have the power within themselves to decide what risk they want to take. I don't ever believe that somebody else has that right to make for me, just like I don't think somebody has the right to say I'm not radical enough if I'm not doing something that they feel I should be doing. And that's where it all comes to this respect issue. Um, I think that um, one of the things that I have found that I get the most concerned about when we talk about diversity of tactics. It always comes down to property destruction versus not property destruction. Like, oh, we're not going to start a revolution and really change this country by just throwing a uh, brick in the Starbucks. It's really not going to change it. True revolution is going to take a lot, though. We are not living in a society that's run under a dictatorship. And if we were, I think we'd see a whole lot of difference in our mindsets and our beliefs. And I think that someday when people do start to come together, they're going to have to think in a different version. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the place that's called Big Mountain. Anybody ever hear of Big Mountain? Big Mountain is in Arizona. It's on the Diné Reservation. Um, Peabody Coal has just, you know, discovered coal, all kinds of natural resources they try to steal. Well, you know, I really support these gun-toting grandmas that live up there, right? They are keeping everybody off their land, and they're doing what they need to do for their own sake, right? When I go there and I show my support, I heard sheep. I don't know anything about sheep, but I'm not the gun-toting grandma that's up there. But I'm there to do what I can to support them and their movement. Um, it's just like when I lived in Austin and the whole revolution for the Zapatistas came about. It's really important to be able to show the support work that you want to do for these different movements. You know, issues that are going on in Palestine. We all know, you know, what happens in those kind of uh, situations. Um, 
And so one of the things I really want people to talk about or think about is if your, what you're doing in your diversity of tactics outweighs any negative. If you fully believe what you're going to do is like a plowshare. How many of you know what the plowshares are? Right. Excellent. So one of the things about the plowshares is they always take the responsibility. So part of their action is the jail sentence, is keeping all the motion going. And whenever you're going to do a different tactic, you have to look at does it outweigh the consequences. And you have to look at that from your own individual, and you have to look at that from a movement building. But if nothing else, and I know we'll talk about this a lot later, we have to learn how to respect each other's tactics. And we have to learn how to do it strategically and how to do what tactic when. And one thing that we really need from Occupy, and Occupy is we need a strategic plan, right? Because then you'll know when things are important and how you have to step things up. Thank you, Kathy. That was awesome. Uh, so I just got word that one of our panelists, uh, Donna Jones, is actually not going to make it tonight. And she didn't have phone access, so couldn't let us know until a minute ago. Um, so unfortunately, we don't have Donna, but that just means we have more time for everyone else in the room to speak later on. Um, also want to let everyone know that Derek Jensen has not yet joined us. Uh, on video conference, so that means we're going to wait for him. Uh, the next person to come up will be George Lakey. Uh, just to introduce George. George has been an activist in a variety of movements his whole adult life. His first arrest was for a civil rights sit-in. His most recent was with Earthquaker Action Group's protest against mountaintop removal coal mining. Uh, he's led over 1,500 social change workshops on six continents, including being smuggled across the border into a guerrilla encampment in the Burmese jungle <laughs> with student revolutionaries. Um, he's currently a visiting professor at Swarthmore College. He's also the author of this book, uh, The Sword That Heals, which uh, is not so much a book as it is a debate that he had uh, with Ward Churchill about... Uh, violence and nonviolence, and it is for sale out in the lobby. So, if you're interested to pick it up after he speaks, take a look. Anyway, please welcome George. Fixing it up, George. That's a bad yeah. location. Bad oh. location for it. Uh, where should I put it? Over here? Uh, there it is. Bring it back now. Bring it back. That's fine. Something like this? That's good. Was oh, that good? Great. Yes, I'm still tall. I'm shrinking at age 74, but I'm not that shrunken yet, so getting the microphone up is good. Tilt at 30 degrees, uh, you know, south, so the folks out over there can read it. Tilt it that way. Tilt it that way. Tilt it this way? That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Whoever thought one person could figure stuff out? <laughs> it's a good thing there's a collectivity. Hi. Very pleased to be here. My focus this evening in this short amount of time that I have is on how to support the Occupy movement and the anti-capitalist movement to grow. Nobody seems to dislike that. <laughs> to grow, become stronger, and also uh, to become more unified. And for that, I think it would be useful to have uh, a strategy Multiple strategies might be useful, but a strategy especially that would, uh, would tend to not only to grow the movement, but also to encourage people to become more unified. And one of the reasons I'm really pleased to be here tonight is because that's one purpose of your being here, is to look for ways that we can work together more effectively. 
Uh, there are a number of strategy tools that, that are available. I've, I've put up here a list of resources for strategy. Um, <laughs> it's not at all an exhaustive list, uh, but I'll continue to write my weekly column, putting more and more strategy tools out that I've used in multiple countries with student revolutionaries in Indonesia, with many people who've been trying to bring down their, their regimes. And as in, in order that, we have tools that we can use together. I know there's a, a 19th century tradition of sending some brilliant person off to come up with a strategy and come back and say, here, comrades, is the strategy. But what I believe is that there is collective wisdom and that what we need is tools that support us to work together to develop our strategies. So one tool is this strategic framework that I put up here. I call it a framework rather than a strategy. It isn't a strategy, but it's a framework through which we can look at how movements can develop over time, become larger, become stronger, become more radical over time, <coughs> in order that eventually they're able to overthrow the 1% and establish something way, way better. So let me just describe this step by step. A few of you do know this framework already, but may not have thought of it in terms of the goal of overthrowing capitalism and establishing something much, much better. And I, I'm very excited that even though this framework can be used for many goals, I think um, it's pretty exciting that we can have a room this size of people considering this kind of goal. So the first step is, uh, is cultural preparation. And that includes especially increased unity around the analysis of what's wrong and increased unity around a vision of what would be better and increased unity about a strategy that would enable us to be playing on the same team rather than mo mostly splitting. As you know, one of the challenges for the U.S. politics historically has been a great tendency to split. <laughs> and, and at some point, it would be great to stop that, or at least to bring it down to some reasonable proportion. And so we need, uh, we, we need all three of those things. The analysis, in, in my estimation, in the Occupy movement, in the radical ecology movement and so on, is really developing very rapidly. And a huge thing to Occupy's credit is that it put on the map the fact that there's class struggle. I know that Warren Buffett said it to the New York Times in 2006. However, a lot of people either didn't believe Warren Buffett or hoped he wasn't right <laughs> and forgot it as quickly as possible. But what Occupy did was put it front and center in American consciousness. And the fact that so many pundits writing, including people who disagree with class analysis, still have to make a bow to that analysis in the media is definite uh, expression of what a huge impact that's made. So analysis is moving along nicely. Vision, not so much in my judgment. Maybe uh, others would disagree. But as far as I can tell, we haven't yet really quite projected a very clear picture of what, uh, if we don't have the 1% guiding our society and setting its direction, then what do we have? What would take its place? <coughs> And a problem about not having that is that it's very hard for to get folks who are in the middle wondering, well, we don't like what it is now, but we don't quite know about this bunch of people being locked into concrete by Kathy. We don't know about those people. It's very, very reassuring for them to know that there's a vision that the movement is going toward. And uh, in my personal experience, my first time being arrested having been in the civil rights movement, it was hugely reassuring to have uh, Dr. King and others, SNCC and so on, uh, describing themselves as having a freedom movement. And freedom, well, you know, it's hard to knock freedom, right, in our country. Right? Freedom, well, that sounds pretty good. And so, there, there, and there, there, were, uh, there was enough meaning to that, enough significance to that. So the people like my dad, working class, blue collar worker, who on the one hand was anti-racist and on the other hand was very uh, scared about insecurity, having been a depression child, was constantly being reassured by the civil rights movement that radical change or even substantial change would not be to his disbenefit. So a vision can be enormously important. One reason why I wrote the article uh, about Norwegians and Swedes uh, breaking the political power of the 1%, which has gotten a viral uh, impact around the world, 
even translated into Arabic by the Yemenis who say, hey, we have a 1% over here too. Uh, one reason I wrote that article was because I was racking my brain for an example of some society on earth that is actually done in the 1%. Not done in in the sense of extinguished it, but so pushed back its political power that the 1% does not dominate and control either Norway or Sweden. And so I wrote that article describing how that was done and what some of the outcome was. I wish I had time to go into that specifically, but all I have to say is free education, free higher education, anyone? And I think a lot of hands would be raised with great interest. Um, if, if you want to, questions and answers, we can go into that. But w the feedback that I've gotten, this is my main point, the feedback that I've gotten from that article from all over the world is so many people excited. You mean somebody's done it? We thought this was this wild thing, so we might as well be romantics and fuck stuff up and yeah, <laughs> because tomorrow we die. You know, something like that. <laughs> not knowing, <laughs> not knowing that there have been human beings that is who share a DNA. You know, I mean, the, hu the human species has actually accomplished enormous changes with regard to overthrowing the one percent, and the, and therefore. We're talking in real-world terms. We can, be, we can feel grounded, even though it's far from clear how to do that exactly in the U.S. At least we know we're not talking about something that's simply somebody's imagination. Strategy is the third thing that we need to develop in this cultural preparation stage. And so you see I'm actually think, placing Occupy in this stage because I think there's so much to be done about it. And that's what we're doing here tonight. The other thing I would say, though, is that it's very important to note, well, no, I won't say that now because I'm in a rush, but I will make the other point, which is already written up here, which is uh, maybe particularly important to do in this society, there are other societies that have this problem also, of working on the oppressions that divide us. Because one reason why the Norwegians and Swedes were able to get so much farther than we were was because their 1% didn't have racial, a racial divide to keep people apart. Um, and, and they used gender to, and they used other things, religion and so on. But they weren't as, it wasn't as easy for the 1% to maintain dominance through division as it is for the U.S., which has done that historically and is doing it right now. And so we need to address that in order to get the breadth of movement that we need. I am assuming we need a huge, a huge movement. Am, am, I, am I with you on this? I mean, a couple hundred thousand people is not going to do it. A couple million people is not going to do it in our society. We're going to need a very, very big movement because it's only people power in the last, last analysis that can counter money power. We're not going to even sharing our piggy banks going to come up with the money power so we'd better do it with the people power and that means a mass movement so stage two then is organizing that mass movement well uh, I, I won't say much about that because I think that's one of the ways that Occupy has really distinguished itself by putting on the American social change agenda the importance of, re of, of a new understanding of leadership that instead of the old hierarchical pattern of putting somebody in charge and directing the troops, that the, the, the birth of the General Assembly and spokes councils and these other innovations are on the road toward the prefigurative politics that actually give people more confidence that the, the vision will be realized, that it won't be one of those envisions out there, a vision to entrance, and then there's the party that takes it <laughs> and runs that next society, which that's been done, right? We don't want to do that. Um, so prefigurative politics is itself enormously reassuring to those tens of millions, and I believe there are tens of millions of Americans who are watching closely, tens of millions who are angry with the 1%, tens of millions who are ready for something different and are watching us, but to convince them to act, it's going to require a lot of reassurance. A lot of people have been scammed in our country, right? Maybe we're the scammers this time. How does anybody know? So we need to prove ourselves in one way is through the organizational forms. And also another way is how much we're successful at going outside our bubble. The downside of prefigurative, and I know as one of the founders of Movement for New Society, I can testify to this. Laughter here from the front, a colleague of mine. Uh, the downside of prefigurative uh, politics is the unwitting, unexpected, or unconscious creating of bubbles 
which gets people into a, a state of righteous euphoria, but does not reach out to the broad uh, numbers of people who need to be reached out for. So that's another thing that we need to tackle in stage two. One reason to do those two stages first before confrontation, although you, Occupy has gotten very far with confrontation up till now, uh, but one reason why more of that would be useful prior to confrontation is confrontation time is when people get scared. Nobody's just green. <laughs> okay, so confrontation time is a time when people get scared and when it's very good to have a clear analysis and <laughs> vision and strategy and it's very useful to have solidarity because the best known antidote to fear is solidarity, it's human association, it's community, it's connection. And the more of that is established before major repression comes on our movement, the better. We've not had major repression on this movement. Um, one reason why I'm grateful that I had the experience in the civil rights movement that I did is that the civil rights movement knew what repression was. The civil rights movement knew what it was like. SNCC went into Mississippi, 1961, Ku Klux Klan was in charge, local law enforcement, there was nobody there to protect the SNCC people. The only way, according to Bob Moses, who told me this personally uh, at in Mississippi summertime where I was a trainer, the only way that, that the SNCC people survived as well as they did was because nobody had a gun in their freedom houses and everybody knew that. And that put enormous pressure. I can go more into the, the sophisticated strategy that was involved here. But that put enormous pressure on the KKK not to wipe out SNCC, which they otherwise, of course, were itching, completely itching to do. But the main reason I refer to this is not so much the strategy in dealing with repression. That's a long subject, and I'm writing pretty much weekly columns on that. But in order to <coughs> remind you, in case you're tempted to complain about the repression that is being so far dealt out to occupy, that it's nothing compared with what the civil rights movement not only experienced, but grew as a result of. Now, of course, Occupy also has the experience of police hit us, we grow, police hit us. That's happened in Portland, happened in Oakland, happened in New York City, right? We know there's this thing called the paradox of repression. The violence on us, then we grow. That's one of the major ways of growing. Gandhi, and if you haven't seen the Gandhi film lately, check it out. At one point he's saying, well, the duty of a civil resistor is to confront in such a way as to bring the truth, <laughs> the truth to bear, to bring the reality to bear. That is one of the dynamics that we work with, and there's no escaping that. But because that's scary, then it's very good to have those first two stages. I wish I had time, but maybe in question time, uh, I can get into this debate that's going on right now between mass actions like G8 and conventions as compared with campaigns. I'll just say, in order to provoke some of you maybe, that I think mass actions are definitely the wrong road for, uh, for Occupy to go in. Same old, same old. No reason based on empirical reality to think that it's going to advance us to grow and to deepen and lots of uh, disadvantages to that, uh, whereas campaigns, I think, have enormous promise in terms of growing the movement. But you might want to get into that at controversy time. How am I doing? I think you're out of time. Very good. I'm out of time. Okay. Well, <laughs> oh, what a contradiction. I'm out of time and I'm doing good. Okay. That sounds like some movements I've been part of. I'm out of time, but doing good. Oh, well. Okay, let me just say that the point of stage three, the point of confrontation, is to grow the movement to the point where there can be mass non cooperation. Mass. I mean, mass. I mean, like, like, uh, Five thousand. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. like a general strike that actually stops a city from operating. It's mass on corporation, Birmingham, Alabama, in 1963, dislocating cities, not uh, through the non-cooperation of people, people not going to work, people not running the trolleys, and all the rest. Mass on corporation is a very, very important stage. We saw it in Egypt. We saw it recently, right? We saw it in Tunisia, so I don't have to go into it more, except 
to emphasize that you can't expect it to come out of nowhere. You can't call for mass non-cooperation and everybody say, oh, okay, George, uh, you know, I was planning to go to the dentist tomorrow, but I'll, uh, you know. No, 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 no. It takes stage three to trigger mass non-cooperation. And then if we get mass non-cooperation, it's demonstrated abundantly in our database over and over ago. Dozens of cases in which mass non-cooperation created a power vacuum that brought down a dictatorial regime, that brought down a military-backed government. But the question then is, what takes its place? That's what the Egyptians are working on right now. What takes its place? That's what we need to be ready for. And as you'll see from that red line on the right, uh, what I believe is that the prefigurative part in stage two can play a vital role in the, planting the seeds for a stage five that will be a new society, that will be highly democratic, that will be egalitarian, that will be participative. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Hi, I'm Vic Hawkins, a member of Central Philadelphia Monthly Meeting and um, an interloper right now with the Interfaith Working Group of Occupy Philadelphia. Um, so the fellow that I work with is named Rabbi Arthur Waskow, and he came forward saying, geez, we've got Palm Sunday coinciding with Passover and Martin Luther King's birthday. No, it doesn't. All right, that one. Let's do something about it. Um, so what if there were something called Occupy Holy Week, Occupy Passover? And what if it brought people of faith together, regardless of what faith, and took a look at the root, the radical piece that we heard about before, and grounded us in the stories that are behind us, and that take us forward into the streets to do something like confront the 1% in the political arena. And, co and confront the 1% in the economic arena. And invite 100%. I heard George talk about there not being factionalization. Let's talk about 100%. And then let's maybe move down the parkway to where the homeless can't be fed as easily as they have in the past because certain regulations are going into effect. And let's celebrate Sado, Seder or a Last Supper, where 100% are represented. That's what's happening on April 1st. Be in touch with us. Thank you, Viv. Elizabeth, do you want to come up? And then uh, Bob also raised his hand. Well, I've been uh, faith-based for a long time. I started out as a Presbyterian and have moved to almost every religion and now <laughs> have finally found Quakerism. But the thing that just amazes me is I think we have a mass group of people if we can touch into each one of those religions and make a special effort to get people activized Look at what has happened to Central Philadelphia. I think it has brought more life and integrity and activism to our group than anything ever has before. And I found it to be absolutely thrilling. And I think it's a microcosm for what can happen all over. And it's really reaching out to people, no matter what you think about uh, several very conflicting ideas. Uh, you can overcome those because there's so much basic stuff like love and sharing and de-developing our lifestyles and getting active. Every one of us putting our religious values into action and we'll, we'll be really surprised to see how really sympathetic they are to each, each one of them and that we can all come together and I think that's really going to be a big thing. Thank you. Um, Bob, do you still want to come up? Well, I'm part of a, uh, a group and was one of the founding members of a thing called the Brandywine Peace Community which has been, since its very inception, rooted in a commitment to nonviolence as an act of expression of faith. And faith as intended as a deepening of our recognition and responsibility to one another and to others. Okay, so I should, one of the I should earlier anything, speakers I made reference to the Plowshares movement, which, of course, the, the first couple Plowshares actions, okay. I'm proud to say, okay. I guess I shouldn't say I'm proud because that's not Catholic, um, <laughs> I'm proud to say came out of the Brandywine Peace Community. But let me assure you of something. It was not understood 
any of those actions as being an attack on property. I can, I can hear. They were meant as symbolic like expressions well. of disarmament, of peacemaking. As Rabbi Heschel used to say, a symbol is an enfleshment of our intention. So the act is still symbolic. It's an, a symbolic expression of our intention. And our intention in those plowshares actions, and I must insist on this in memory of my very, very dear friend Philip Berrigan, was rooted in nonviolence and in the sacrifice involved in nonviolence. Thank you. Okay, so we want to do a sound check. Whoa. Okay. Derek, are you able to hear us through the computer? Oh, Derek. <laughs> oh, I didn't know you were talking to me. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> um, so can you hear, can you hear me through the computer? Oh, wait, wait. You know why? Because my computer, my sound is off on my computer. That's why. Okay, let's fix that. Okay, now sound is Okay, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Can you hear me? We can't hear you. Yeah. No, no, okay, we, we can turn up your volume. Um, but actually, take the phone away from your mouth. Let, let's make sure we can hear you through the computer. Okay, so I'm going to take the phone away. Okay. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Oh okay, we're going to hang up the phone. <laughs> Bye. I mean, hello. Okay, great. Derek, can you hear me? Derek, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you great. Okay, this is Alex Knight talking. So I'm going to just introduce you, and then we're actually ready for you to go um, and speak for 10 or 15 minutes. So are you ready for that? Um, yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So you, you actually made it just in time because we just finished our other three, um, well, two panelists and a makeshift panelist. Um, <laughs> Uh, Donna couldn't join us, so we had other folks speak from a faith-based perspective. But we're ready for Derek. Derek Jensen <laughs> is a prolific author who has written a bunch of influential books, including A Language Older Than Words, Culture of Make-Believe, Endgame, and more recently Deep Green Resistance, which we do have for sale in the lobby as well. Um, Derek speaks widely about many things, including how to take down civilization. <laughs> and uh, he is joining us via video, and he just got back from the doctor. So welcome, Derek. <laughs> Please welcome. Yeah, thank you for having me. And um, um, of course, it's what? 4.35 here, and my doctor's appointment was at 3, but any of you who have ever been to doctors know that that means that, and the doctor's office is about 10 minutes from here, so a doctor's appointment at 3 means I'm really lucky to get out of there at 4.35, you know? Um, okay. Um, also, I obviously have to apologize if anything I say replicates what was said before, because I have no idea what was said before. Um, and then... Okay, let me know correctly if, if this, I mean, I'm supposed to be talking about um, the question of resistance to oppression and uh, questions of violence or nonviolence. Is this, is this I mean, somewhat accurate? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah, I mean, what, what sorts of strategies and tactics have, do you believe have been effective or, that, or do you practice, um, and would you recommend that uh, Occupy, you know, consider as we move forward? Well, I think I would like to start by mentioning a few um, either. Well, I would like to start by mentioning a few things that I think we should take as self-evident. And... One of them is that the planet is being murdered. 200 species are extinct today, and 200 will go extinct tomorrow, and 200 adapt to that. And they are 
my brothers and sisters. And I think something else that's very important is to recognize that power is not a mistake. And those with power won't change because we act nicely. And I think we should also recognize that underlying patriarchy and underlying the dominant culture, it's like Mary Daly says, there's only one religion in the world right now, and it's patriarchy. And underlying patriarchy is a drive to violate it. That one of the ways, and this is, this is cultural and not biological, one of the ways that men within patriarchy have their masculinity validated is by declaring some other to be other and inferior and then violating this other. So white people can be superior and can declare people of color to be inferior and therefore viable. And men can be superior and declare women to be inferior and therefore viable. And it is through this very violation that their masculinity is is validated and also reaffirmed in terms of if I can violate this other, then the other must be in fear. And there are many problems with this, one of which of course is on the planet, another of which is that it's horribly immoral. And another problem is that there's a great line by Artie Lang, which is that how do you fill a void filling a void? And the point is that they're attempting to validate their existence and their identity through violation. That's not really how our, 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 our identity is supposed to be validated. At least they're not really validating anything. And besides which, there are always others who can be validated, I'm sorry, who can be violated, and therefore it's insatiable, which is one reason that the United States has bombed the moon. And this is one reason they have to send probes to the deepest cold of the ocean. Everything must be violated. Okay, I say all this as a preamble, because I think one of the things that's really central to my work is the understanding that the problems we now to face are not fundamentally rational, and therefore they cannot be solved through rational discussion. Um, slavery was not stopped by, by, by people simply, well, it's like it hasn't stopped. But as far as it has been stopped, it hasn't been stopped by people simply saying, wow, that's a really bad moral idea. Um, and so my point is that those in power only understand force. And that does not mean that they only understand violence. It means that, I mean, I think probably most of the people in this room have heard of Gene Sharp, and they know that if you have the numbers, you can accomplish great change through purely nonviolent means. But you still have to understand force. Because it's negative that capital is cheap to not serve capital is a bad bet when the planet is hanging in the balance. So, as far as what I believe we need, I believe the first thing we need to do is to start asking ourselves what we want. And then, because I don't think we do a really good job of that. And and then I think we need to start thinking strategically. So if what we want is, is, is A, then we need to accomplish B. And a great example of this is if you ask any reasonably intelligent 10-year-old how do you stop global warming that's caused the great magnitude by the burning of oil and gas, the 10-year-old will tell you, stop burning oil and gas. <laughs> <laughs> and if you ask a reasonably intelligent 35-year-old, works for a high-tech, green high-tech consulting firm, I stop global warming and cause a great measure by burning oil and gas. I'll give you the answer that it has to do with 
that, that will help the, the, the high tech consultant firm. And how much time do I have left? <laughs> like Eric, you, no, you have about eight minutes left. Okay. Um, so I think we need to ask ourselves first what it is we want and what what we want is possible. So I mean I'm very clear on what I want, which is I want to live in a world that has more wild sand than every year before, more migratory songbirds. And I want to live in a world where there is less dioxin every year in every mother's breast milk. And there's less plastics in the ocean. And so the first step toward having less dioxin in every mother's breast milk, you would think, would be to stop the production of toxic chemicals which lead to the dioxin in every mother's breast milk. And if I were the if I were in charge of things, I could simply order this by fiat, but I'm not. And, and those in power have not shown themselves amenable to stopping. So the question becomes, how do we stop them? And I think that something that's really helped me to reframe the problem we face is to recognize what so many indigenous people have said to me, which is the first and most important thing for us to do is to decolonize our hearts and minds, to separate ourselves from the system and to not identify with the system. And one way that I think about this is to think of space aliens that come down from outer space and they were systematically deforesting the planet and they were vacuuming the oceans. Ninety percent of the large fish in the oceans are gone and there are solid scientists who are saying the oceans could be devoid of fish in 50 years. And our response is what? To carry science? To write books? And if space aliens were doing this, we would know what to do, which is to take out the infrastructure that allows the aliens to do this. And another way to say this is that one of the problems with a lot of these environmentalists is that all of the so-called solutions to global warming, for example, take industrial capitalism as a given. And the natural world is that which must conform to industrial capitalism. And they say explicitly, they're, they're, they're attempting to save civilization. But it is civilization itself that is killing the planet. This is kind of like saying, we're trying to figure out how we can save Ted Bundy. And it's really crucial, I think, that we take a step back and that's why I say it's really important to figure out what we want. Because if what we want is to figure out a way to have computers and, uh, and jet skis and retractable stadium roofs, <laughs> modern industrialized medicine, and at the same time have a planet, you can't. You can't consume a planet and have it too. So the first thing, it's like a doctor friend of mine says, the first step for diagnosis, the first step for cure is proper diagnosis. And now having said that we need to, um, that if these were space aliens, we would take out the infrastructure that allows them to wage war against the planet and wage war against the poor. I also need to say that sometimes I get pegged as a violence guy, and I don't like that very much because it's not accurate. And what I really am is the everything guy. Because I want to point out that only 2% of the IRA ever picked up weapons. And it's definitely important for us to build a resistance movement. And that resistance movement includes things like Occupy, it includes those things of what they're doing. And in addition, I think we need to start thinking strategically. To go back to what I said before about understanding the force, I, would, I think that Occupy, if I were to be able to give advice to Occupy, it would be to move beyond symbolic occupation and move toward occupations that significantly impair the functioning of the economic machine. The French did this 14 months ago 
during their general strike in, in France, they did not simply occupy spaces, but instead they recognized that without oil, there is no economy, and they moved to blockade oil terminals. And my whole point in that is that that's thinking strategically. So now I'm going to go back in another direction and say that the line I'm probably most famous for, I wrote 13, 15 years ago. Uh -oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote that line is because. <laughs> We missed it. <laughs> Say it again. We missed it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> the most famous line I have is probably every morning when I wake up, I ask myself whether I should ride or blow up a dam. And did you get that line? Yeah. Okay. And one, one thing I was trying to get at with that line is the distinction between symbolic and non-symbolic action. The writing a book is really important, or, or holding a meeting, or acting in solidarity. All symbolic actions can be really important, but it's not actually a lack of symbolic actions until it's in. It's the presence of the ends. And so, one thing I think is really important also is to recognize that symbolic actions are important, but they are still recruiting tools. And at some point, actual physical actions need to take place. And I, I guess I want to say one more thing, and then I'll, I'll wind up, which is that one thing that really offends me deeply is that I just got a note a couple days ago. You know, I'm, I'm sure many of you know about the whole Chris Hedges hullabaloo with um, where I was interviewed about the Black Bloc, and I said that I thought the Black Bloc actions were unstrategic, immoral, and, un and untactical quite often. And I got a lot of attacks for doing that, including a death threat. And that kind of made my point. And, <laughs> and I got a note a couple days ago from somebody saying, what, are you saying that we can never be militant? And I just want to say that something I find really offensive is that the notion of throwing a rock through a window is what substitutes for militants. Well, I guess one person like this. <laughs> the, the point I was attempting to make was not an attack against militants, but it's an attack against being stupid. <laughs> and, um, I guess the last thing I want to say is that um, is that we're we're in, we're in Philadelphia, right? I knew you were in Philadelphia, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. yes. And um, this is associated with Quakers, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to tell this story that I've told a bunch of times. Now, if, if, if this ends up apocryphal, then I will be sorely embarrassed. But it's a story I just desperately love about how the Black Panthers were looking for a place to hold a meeting. And they, I can barely say it's They were looking for a place to hold a Congress. And uh, the Quakers, even though they themselves did not necessarily agree with the Panthers on the use of guns, um, <laughs> recognized that the, they, um, oh, nice. They allowed the Panthers to use their meeting house. And the reason they did this is because they knew, and then they rigged them with their own bodies because they knew that the cops wouldn't kill white people to get it done. If we are to survive, and if we're to this wretched machine that is killing every kind of planet, we need that sort of solidarity between those who believe in different tactics. And we need to work together. And I guess that's what I'd like to have. Thank you.
Thank you, Derek. I'm kind of kidding. I'm kind of kidding. But if that story isn't true, don't tell me because it'll break my heart. <laughs> Someone I trust just said that it is true. So. Um, thank you, Derek, and everyone who has spoken. Um, so I'd like to ask if George and Kathy would like to come up to the front and just sit down. And then um, what I would suggest is that we um, take questions first. Um, if people have questions for any of the people who have spoken, and then we could field those questions. And then maybe that'll lead nicely, I hope, into a broader discussion of, you know, what everyone thinks, um, you know, a revolution will look like or should look like. Um, so why don't we start with questions, and where did Laura go? Do you want to take stack, Laura? So Laura over there is going to take stack, and that means... If you want to ask a question, raise your hand, and Laura will write down your name, and then we'll go in that order. Derek, can you see what's going on? I can see the audience, and I saw the wonderful people sitting down on the stage, and then we put it back down and it's not Now I can see the people on stage. Hi, Derek. This is Kathy. I was the one who clapped for you earlier. <laughs> Hi, Derek. This is George. And this story about Quakers and Black Panthers is correct. Yay! 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 Which meeting? Which meeting? Here in Philadelphia. Fourth and Arch. Yay! So, Laura, who was the first question? Uh, Dina. Hi. Hi to everybody who spoke. You were all wonderful. I'd like to ask George, about whom I write often on my blog, but I, have my, I didn't know you had written an article about Sweden and uh, Norway. Can you tell me where you wrote that article and when so I can get it? <laughs> I've just recently become a weekly columnist for Waging Nonviolence, and some of the articles get picked up by Alternet and all kinds of places. And that's one of the articles that got picked up. So you might find it on your friendly local website. But if you want to, I, I've been asked by the editor to, to write my columns with Occupy Strategic Debates in mind. And so that's what I've been doing. So you might like to catch up on the last few weeks of that. Waging nonviolence, easy to Google. Okay. Fair? Yeah. Um, I think, George, um, I, I think you said that you prefer campaigns over mass movements. I wonder if you could define those and defend them and then tell us how to move forward. Okay, okay. Great. Actually, I didn't say as opposed to mass movements. I, I think mass movements are more likely to grow massive if they use a series of campaigns. An example of that is Egypt, where you know, 2002 or so, people began to get clarity that it was Mubarak they wanted to focus on rather than focus on reforming Islam or, uh, the way it was set up in Egypt, or rather than re focusing on reforming um, the economy. Uh, but still, uh, it wasn't the kind of thing you blow the trumpet and everybody comes to Tahrir Square in 2002, right? So they did a series of campaigns that were going after specific things. For example, 2006, major textile strikes that, that happened and that middle class allies learned how to be allies of working class people. And that series of campaigns not only accomplished specific changes in, along the way, even though there was also tremendous repression, but also it gave people confidence that they could ride through repression, that they could build solidarity across class lines. And so by the time 2011 came, people were ready to do the stage, what I call stage four. But they built that confidence and those skills through a succession of campaigns that had particular limited uh, objectives. And of course, there's a bunch of campaigns already in embryo happening in, in, uh, in Occupy, right? I came from Boston recently, a couple weeks ago, where they're working on the public transportation, which is outrageous, to raise the rates and raise the prices and lower the service at the same time. And who's there but Occupy 
already doing a nonviolent direct action campaign to stop that from happening. So I think there, there's a lot of campaign energy in Occupy, but it hasn't exactly been, um, it hasn't become a consensus strategically, and so there's also this seduct what I call a seduction <laughs> in the direction of Chicago G8 and the conventions and so on, which I think is actually a, a blind alley. I think that uh, the, the evidence, 99 got something real done. Very, very important, 99 in Seattle. But some of the subsequent ones, including Philadelphia's encounter with the Republican convention, was a terrible mistake. It took in Philadelphia us years to recover from the, the terrible mistake of that, of that time. And, and, and my friends in Twin Cities tell me just the same in 2008. And I, 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 can pick, I, I understand from participating in mass actions, the excitement of that, it's wonderful to look around and everywhere you see, you know, oh my God, we're doing, and I've been in part of gay marches because I'm a gay man in Washington and so on, where it was fabulous to have a lot of people all standing up together and doing civil disobedience and so on. The trouble is that the way those things have been orchestrated in the, in the you know, since, uh, since 2000 on have tended to be just uh, sort of self-righteous congratulatory things in which we got a lot of stories about repression from police and we get a lot of stories about terrible mass media but through which the movement doesn't grow at all. Mm -hmm. And I'm for the growth of the movement rather than more stories we can tell people about how terrible the mass media is, excuse me while I yawn, and also <laughs> how terrible the police are. <laughs> Boring. Same old, same old. Occupy made such an impact on American society because it was fresh. So I would say, let's stay fresh. <laughs> Kathy? Well, I have mad respect for George and always have. I have to disagree with him. Right. I actually think it's a combo. Um, so it was, uh, I, I think it's interesting you bring up the, you know, Philadelphia and the Republican Convention, because unfortunately it was my blockade materials that kind of caused a lot of ruckus, literally, um, to do with all that. And I'd like to just state for the record, not all puppets have blockades in them. Um, but I think that it's a combo. One of the things that I, I do strongly agree with George on, um, and Derek uh, spoke on as well, and we, I, I said to my husband, I said, there's one word the three of us keep using, and that's strategy. And we're lacking in that strategy, and to me, campaigns or what pulled that strategy together. And the other day, even on one of the listservs, one of the many, many listservs I received from Occupy, I actually mentioned um, there was this big debate about, you know, what people should be working on and should there be GAs at all and what, you know, is this even useful? And what I wrote about was that the beauty of Occupy is that we all have different passions, different parts that really draw us together so to speak, campaigns, whether it is, you know, the education aspect, whether it's, you know, foreclosures, what, whatever your passion is, you bring that together. And I'd like to see us build campaigns around that and your different passions. But where I disagree with George is that the, the mass movements, the mass actions, though I, I do agree they're not very strategic sometimes. Um, if we could come together like we did that energy in um, when we were in Seattle, it was so truly diverse with all the different campaigns coming together to create a mass action. One of the things that I think that that does is it really sparks people. It sparks that energy. And I have seen a lot of people come out of those mass actions. And so to me, it's great to work on all these campaigns that are so necessary. But sometimes, you know, and I, I don't necessarily mean it literally, but sometimes it's really awesome to come together and work in the streets and fuck shit up. And I don't mean by just destroying a building or tearing down a fence or throwing a brick. I mean it truly in the sense of stopping something, stopping traffic, stopping work as usual, having a general strike, having that mindset where people come together find that there are people who agree with them and have some like energy, take that excitement and that energy back to their individual campaigns. Thank you. Um, the next person on the stack was Mike. Do you want to come up here, Mike? It's really quick. I just, George, could you explain prefigurative movements for those of us who don't know? Yes. I just asked if you could, if George, if you could explain prefigurative movements or prefigurative groups for those of us who don't know, thank you. I've been at Swarthmore too long, <laughs> using jargon. Um, alternative institutions. 
And we have a glorious history of that in, in the U.S., right? When the women's movement was starting, next thing you know, there were women's health clinics. There were, right, uh, co-ops. We're still, people are still organizing co-ops. Alternative institutions where you're trying to develop the skills and organizational uh, capacities that are different from the prevailing way it's going so that then when a power vacuum is opened, the, we already have the skills and the confidence that we can put into the, vac put into the vacuum the things that, that, that would be run the way we want to run them rather than simply replicating the old order. So that's the point of, uh, and Gramsci or somebody came up with that idea of uh, calling it prefigurative apologies. But what we really mean here is alternative institutions. And the important thing about alternative institutions for me is not only that they build skills and confidence, but also that they have some edge to them. So I do have some debate with some of my transition town friends who want to put it in such soft terms that I don't see any, any edginess in terms of real... Uh, you know, confrontation with the old order. And one of the ways that I really appreciate Derek Jensen's work is he keeps calling us to the urgency of this. So if we have a strategy of very soft stuff that would take 50 years before the 1% even noticed that we were doing it, then it's probably not strategic. So I, I'd say to my transition town friends, let's do it, but let's do it in an edgy way so that already the, the, the struggle is joined. Thank you. So Ron's going to be next on the questions, and we have a few more after that. Thanks, Alex. Uh, this question is for Derek, and at first I want to say hello from Deep Green Philly and also from Deep Green Resistance Northeast. Uh, we're really happy that you're here, and um, we're really hoping that there will be a conference on the East Coast because it's always on the West Coast, and we feel <laughs> neglected, really. So, um, My question is about empathy. Uh, you spoke a lot about the uh, the natural world and also about people of color. Um, we're living, of course, in a so society that's dominated by, you know, white supremacy and capital. Um, how do we get people who are living in such a privileged society to have empathy for people who they might not really care about, uh, such as people of color or the natural world? And these are the people who are actually suffering the most from industrial capitalism. Um, that's my question. Thanks. <laughs> if I knew how to make members of privileged classes care about those they exploit. I think in 20 books I'll have said it by now. Um, I don't... Okay, okay. Um, I have a couple things. One of them is that uh, uh, maybe 10 years ago I was fantasizing about... I was never going to do this. But I was fantasizing about what it would be like to go over to Iraq and say, Hey, I'm a good American. I'm here to help you all out. And I would say in English, of course, because that's the only language I know. And, and, and then would I, would I last like 24 or 36 hours before I got shot? And, and what I realized through that fantasy was that it is not up to members of oppressed classes to differentiate among members of oppressor classes. It is the responsibility of, press, of members of oppressor classes to differentiate themselves. So it's not up to women to figure out that I'm not a rapist. It's up to me to differentiate myself from most men. And it's not up to, not up to you as an African American or African or however you decide to, to however you are comfortable designating yourself. It's not up to you to differentiate me from every other white person. It's up to me to differentiate myself, which of course is a really nice way of avoiding the question altogether. <laughs> okay, so now I wonder for years why we didn't have a lot more effective alliances between some of the far left and the far right. Because, like my sister, is really right wing, but she and I come together because she's so right wing that she absolutely believes in, in local control of economies. 
But she's not a fake right-wing person in that way. She actually does believe it. And so when she was on the city council, she voted against a lot of so-called developments because they were run by people from outside her community. Mm -hmm. So she and I would have agreed because I would have said, uh, yes, you need, you can't come develop here because you actually need to go to hell and develop there. <laughs> <laughs> and she would have said, you can't develop here because you're from Washington, D.C. and we're from Virginia. <laughs> and so in effect, it would have been the same way. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that another way to put all this is that if I go talk to some local guy who runs a local computer store, I'm not going to talk to him about the salmon because the truth is he doesn't care. What I will talk to him about is Walmart because Walmart's driving him out of business. And he has literally had to go get a job at the local prison because it drove his computer store out of business. So my point is that I don't know how you get people to care about about those who are being exploited. What I attempt to do is I attempt to find the places, I attempt two things, one positive, one negative. I attempt to help people find what they love and help them to defend it. Except, except I gotta watch out for this. I started to tell the story about the left wing and the right wing, why they don't come together. But I used to believe, wonder why that didn't happen more often until I met some honest to goodness, hardcore, right wing, racist, sexist, excuse my language, assholes. And, and then I realized why we don't work together. <laughs> because these people were really nasty and there's no place we can come together. And so I think one thing we need to do, hey, here we go. Okay, after all this talking, I got an answer. <laughs> one part is, first off, we need to figure out who is reachable and who isn't. A lot of people simply aren't reachable. And so I don't argue with people because I read this thing a long time ago that says it takes 10 years to change your mind. So, like, I present my perspective. If somebody disagrees with me, fine. I go talk to somebody else because somebody's going to be ready. It's like being a recruiter. It is being a recruiter. So, first off, how do you find people? If you talk to somebody about oppression and they come up with all sorts of excuses, fine. Find somebody else. Second thing is um, that the positive thing, I try to find what people love and we talk about that. You know, I was doing a talk one time at a university where the, the teachers had made their students come to the talk. And I hate it when they do that because all the students are sitting there the whole time texting. They don't care. Um, and so they sit there for like one hour, one hour and one minute, and then they leave. And then the audience gets really good because all the people who only are there for credit are gone. But what I've done a few times, so I'm talking about the world being filled and talking about all this stuff, everybody's bored. And then I just switch and I start talking about the fact that um, it's crazy to have a wage economy. And most people who work jobs don't work jobs they love. And it's insane, and school is really setting up, setting you up to work a job you don't love for the rest of your life. And all of a sudden, they stop texting and they look at me. And it's like, oh, that's kind of cool. <laughs> so the is that you can find something, you can find somebody's issue that, that affects them, and you start there. And the negative, that's, so you find what they love. One negative way to say that is you find the places where they're discontented, and you start driving in wedges. Mm -hmm. You start driving in wedges between them and the whole oppressive system. And I'm sure that the other members of the panel have much better answers than I, but those are my answers. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the next question is actually coming from Zachary. Does this work? All right, thank you. Um, this is a question that comes out of Kathy. Uh, Kathy, your excellent speech, which was really surprising and really good. Um, not, well, I, came in, I came in with skepticism about diversity of tactics, and I love, I'm a nonviolent direct action trainer, as you know, we work together, um, and I really love the perspective that you took. Um, and I, what I'd like to do is ask a question, kind of draw out what I think is a really healthy contradiction in what you were saying that's natural to all this work. And I think it's present in some of the stuff that you've done too, Derek. I read Deep Green Resistance and really appreciated it. And so, Kathy, when you spoke, um, you started off by saying, you know, everybody kind of has the right to do what they feel like they need to do. 
and kind of where you're at and like make those decisions. But then you really complicated that in what I thought was an awesome way and grounded it in your experiences in Seattle where you were like, I was running blockades and people were breaking windows and those tactics could not coexist healthily in that space. And so I was expecting you to come in here and really be like diversity of tactics, whatever folks want to do, you know, throw it out there. But you actually, I felt, gave a really strong refutation of the concept of diversity of tactics. And one contradiction I heard in what you were saying is that tactics can't necessarily coexist and that all of them don't necessarily feed into each other. And Derek, I heard you talking about that too when you said, you know, I'm cool with people doing whatever, but don't be stupid about it because <laughs> some stuff is counterproductive. And so what I wanted to ask you both, and I know this is a really complicated question, is how do you guys negotiate the conversation around diversity of tactics? Do you feel that the language of diversity of tactics is just a totally anti-strategic, do whatever you want frame that works against our ability to hold each other in discipline? And how has that come into play in work that you guys have done on the ground? Okay. Yeah. So that's a really excellent question. And, and I start by saying, you know, it, it is a contradiction because we're, we're human and life is full of contradictions. In my head, I, I, in my head, I, I see this world. I don't want to cry like he was earlier. Um, I see this world I want. And I know the way I'd like us to get there. And that's like this whole amazing nonviolent pathway of like Gandhi and resistance. I just don't believe it's going to happen. Um, and, and like Derek talked about like, you know, all these like, you know, he used this great, there's great examples of like, you know, people of color, versus, you know, and white people and men and women and, and, and as an, as an earth firster, and, and someone who believes in deep ecology, we, we forget the human versus the non-human, um, and the, the, those that can't speak for themselves. Um, in Seattle, and I use that example a lot. I use that example in all my blockade trainings and everything. Is is I use it because what I didn't do was walk up to somebody with a brick and pull them aside and say, "You can't do that," because I do believe in autonomy. Um, but what I did do, and afterwards, is have, and I have many, many, many friends that are part of Black Box, um, had great conversations about why maybe not at the same time that I'm having, you know, people blockading stuff. Um, and, and when, you know. But then, you know, you look at, you look at everything, and, you know, you look at, you look at Seattle, and the, the contradiction of, well, well, did the, the media, show so much what was going on only because of the mass violence that got exhibited um, from the police repression. The police repression was coming regardless of whether or not somebody broke a window in Starbucks with a brick. It was there already. I was part of a flying, a flying squad. I was a tactical squadron person and, and I, my job was, well, my role, and it was only a job, but my role was to, to go into all these hot spots. Um, and so because of my passion, I, 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 and I, <laughs> and I laugh with, with Derek. I, I pull, I said to my husband when he used the, the S word, stupid, I said, oh, please, Al, make sure I don't use the stupid word tonight, um, because that's how I felt, too. I don't want things to be stupid. I don't want them to not make sense. Um, but I also don't want to stand there in the middle of a, of a protest and take my energy away and tell people what they shouldn't be doing on either side. Um, even though my belief is that it's not tactical, it's not strategic. I, I don't think we're going to, I don't think we're going to save the planet and change the world by throwing bricks through windows. I just don't buy it. And I really, for those of you who do, I wish I did. I really <laughs> wish I did buy it for you. Um, but I don't. I do believe in mass mobilization of people, though. And I do believe that until we have those millions that are, like, I'm looking at this very nice lady who smiles every, at me with the pink. And, and, and I look at you and I'm like, I want you on a blockade with me as much as I want Amanda and her philosophies on a blockade with me. As much as I want my husband and his philosophies on the blockade with me. And then I want us together doing the massive changes. Like, 
like when we, you know, as an earth I, I faced many of the people that Derek talked about. Um, <laughs> they're true, just opposite of me, um, on many logging roads in Idaho. And our, our job, our role, again, was to find the commonality because I was stopping them from working that day. I was taking food from their children because they're not getting paid if they don't dump that load. But one night I sat in, a, in one of the largest contiguous forests in the United States and I watched two wolves walking by because I was behind a brush waiting for the morning so we could blockade that entire section and hold a road for 45 days. And to many of you, that might not be much. But to see those two wolves in the wild was everything that I believed in. And I just, you know, all I could say to loggers was, if you don't stop what you're doing, there's not going to be a planet left. And if we don't start figuring out a way to work together, we are not going to change society. And so that's where the dichotomy comes in because you can't always have it both ways, but we have to figure out how to find some common ground. Derek, that question was also addressed to you. Do you want to, do you have a response that you want to share? Um, yeah, I do. And, and first I wanted to say that what you just said is, is beautiful and brilliant. And thank you. Um, and then I don't actually see real diversity of tactics as, I don't even see it as a contradiction, much as I love contradictions. Um, and I have one word that, for me at least, resolves the contradiction, which is firewall. And I think that if you put an absolute firewall between above ground and below ground actions, there's no contradiction. You can work together. Um, and what I mean by that is one of the problems I have with the so-called black block tactics or whatever people want to call it, with breaking windows, is like separate from the from the specifically and exclusively nonviolent action. That doesn't mean don't break a window. It means and it, here's another thing, it's target selection. It's like if if black block okay, so like Oakland, you know, they, they did this stuff, they they looted a bunch of shops, all that stuff. It's like okay, if instead what they wanted to do was to take out some of the pumps on the Sacramento River to protect Delta Smell, I would be so down for that, you know? That would be a tangible action that actually helps the real world. And and also, it needs to be completely separate. Um, that's, this is the lesson that all resistance movements learn, is except under very specific circumstances, you can't mix. It, it, it doesn't really, it, it's not usually tremendously effective to have the same people in the same place doing actions that are, I mean, I, I agree with you completely. The whole Gandhian thing ain't gonna work. And that's not gonna cause, that's not gonna stop the capitalists from killing the planet. And, but the thing is, I've, I've worked with a ton of activists from India, and we only hear about Gandhi. We never hear about the Sikhs. We never hear about all the uh, people with guns. And, you know, it's, it's... There were Quakers who helped. I mean, it's not just the Black Panthers. There were Quakers who helped with the um, Underground Railroad, and Harriet Tubman carried guns. And... Um, what I, when I hear, I don't have a problem with the word diversity of tactics, the phrase diversity of tactics. Um, one problem I have with the way it has been used sometimes in discourse is that, and this is actually the only place where I think I, I might disagree with you a little bit on what you just said. I thought everything you said was great, but a place where I, I think I disagree a little bit is I believe that there is a role for um, if we have an agreed upon set of uh, tactics that we're going to use, I think it's appropriate to tell someone in that particular time not to use that, not to use another tactic um, within that context. 
context. This is not to say you can never use it in another context. And I got into a big argument maybe 10 years ago now with a couple of the anarchists in, uh, in Eugene, Oregon, actually. And um, it was because they were saying that no one can ever tell anyone else what to do under any circumstances. And I said, okay, let's pretend that this is 1942 Russia. And let's pretend that we are both members of the Russian resistance. And let's pretend that me and my brother and you two anarchists are going to do an action against the Germans. And let's pretend that we all commit to doing this. And let's pretend that me and my brother show up at the space, and then we, you don't show up, but it's a crucial action, so we do it anyway, and my brother dies, I'm gonna kill you. <laughs> because you just killed my brother. And my point is that we can make commitments, and we can make temporary commitments. We can make a commitment that for this time period in this space, we are not going to throw a brick. And that doesn't mean you can never throw a brick in your life. And in fact, at some point, if you have the right target, I really hope you do it. Right. And right here and right now, we've made this commitment that this is how we're going to behave. Well, and I want to say one more thing that had to do with the previous question very quickly. Um, and that was the, about um, the importance of having, I don't remember the exact terms, but the importance of organizing prior to something and having, having preparations. Good to hear it. It's just one of the things I've found just terribly disappointing but also predictable about the whole Arab Spring is that I think that the left was not that organized in Egypt and it's no surprise that, it, that, the, that the Brotherhood has taken over um, because they have a long time organization. That just shows to me the importance of all, exactly what you were saying about the importance of all this pre-organization, hitting it again and again and again and being prepared. I just want to validate that. Thank you. Yes, I, can I just clarify something? I just want to clarify yeah. one thing. I agree that, I'm sorry, that people should have agreements and there was agreements in Seattle. I didn't personally say something because that wasn't my role. That was the roles of the peacekeepers. And I believe that people should stick within their roles. And I guess I probably should have clarified that more, that there were agreements. And I do believe when you have agreements, it does make for a much more successful action. I just didn't feel that my job, my role, it was most effective for me to be telling people what to do in that moment. But peacekeepers, they dealt with those different things. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Terry. So I'm all for strategy, as we've heard here tonight over and over again. And those of you who know me know that I'm always asking, why are we doing what we're doing? And George, you talked about vision. So I'm just going to throw it out there. What's our vision for how to fix this society? Vision for fixing society. I I have written a book about it, <laughs> or that has a lot of vision in it. It's called Strategy for Living Revolution, and it uh, it includes this four five stage framework, but it also puts forward if we were to be if we were to do that if we were to take away the political power of the 1% so that we were free to have the kind of society we want, including the environmental uh, relationship that we want, um, then what might that look like? And, and so I, I have written it. It would take a long time to describe it here. But, uh, but one reason why I wrote the Norway and Sweden piece is because they show you know, rather than out of my imagination or, or even a collective imagination, and I believe in collective imagination very strongly and individual imagination, they've actually on the ground built uh, societies that while my vision, my most visionary friends in Norway and Sweden both have a lot of complaints, I say, well, to an American, it looks almost like paradise because it is so, so different. Uh, so so uh, I do recommend that piece. That's easier than getting my book. And there's enough in it. Also, I am working on a book on Norway in order to spell that out more clearly. Because what I have found is that we have uh, – my belief about our culture, actually, U.S. culture, is that we tend to be anti-vision. We recently had a president who called – you know, referred to the vision thing, something like that. A lot of people said, right, who cares who needs a vision thing? And so um, – 
And yet, I think without a vision, the people perish. So that, I'm trying to sneak one in through the, the Norwegian example of, uh, because that's, that's real and people can visit it and people can criticize it, which is always also important about a vision, but also people have lived in it and can experience it. Thank you. Um, I want to thank you for that really excellent question about vision. And I think that's something that we should all consider and that we should all be thinking about. And, but we, we do have a few more questions that we want to hear. Um, the next one was from Austin right here. Okay, thank you. I don't have a question directed for any one person, but I think uh, this co whole conversation has been great. There's been so much food for thought. And uh, I believe that no matter what, we're, we're in it for life. We're going to be in this for generations to come. And so there's not going to be any one given answer that we know is the answer, the way. And so I feel to a certain degree we need to be scientific about it and look at what different groups are doing and observe the results and the outcomes as we're evolving our praxis over time. And I personally feel that a social democratic uh, regime like perhaps you'd find in Sweden would be a big step forward from what we have here in Philadelphia now as far as for the human being, sure. Uh, Health care, food, education, that would be great. I would contend personally that's not going to resolve all the contradictions of the society, especially in a globalized economy that's uh, destroying the earth and the balance of nature. It's going to take more than that. But it would be a great reform to achieve that in the context of a longer and deeper program for really fundamental change in the institutions of society. I also feel that um, diversity of tactics during our actions, yes, absolutely, um, there's going to be diversity, but within those tactics, it's really, really legitimate that we expect that people who want to do something different than what was organized do it sort of in their own way and as an identifiable, you know, identifiably their own group. Um, and finally, as far as the firewall goes, that's an area of real concern for me because, uh, you know, I come from the Pacific Northwest and we've seen the, the, the results of the FBI prosecutions and of Operation Blowback. And I think people need to be very clear that when we talk about these acts of underground resistance, and forming cells and, you know, all these sorts of things, the stakes are very, very high. People, in my view, have paid with their lives and achieved very little. I don't believe that they lit the fuse of revolution that they thought they were going to do, and instead they found themselves under um, enhanced terrorism, uh, enforcement, uh, using laws and policies that were not even in, in effect when uh, the actions which they're accused of having committed were fulfilled. And I think we're right now up against a bloated national security state that has never been as well funded as it is today. That's very, very sophisticated. And while, so, while I do think we have every cause to be very, very militant, we do also need a broad movement. We have a right to defend ourselves but we need to be very, very thoughtful about what we do. And time will tell as we watch the different tendencies and see what the outcomes are, which are the winning strategies. As time goes on, we will have to really critically examine that and keep evolving our own strategies and tactics from the viewable results of uh, what's been tested in the, uh, in the real world. You want to find a yeah. I just want to, you brought up a, a point that I, I was actually in my notes that um, when, you, when you look at diversity of tactics, the, the more successful as a movement we become, the more the tactics that they use against us are. And you have to be really careful in this whole diversity of tactics and with agent provocateurs. Um, it was a long, long history of that in this country. And, you know, that's one, one of the reasons, you know, to your question earlier, why I don't really have the energy to spend on certain things. Um, 
because I do believe that the government actually like implants people into our organizations to create that, and I too have um, lost some friends and have a lot of issues. Know of what a lot of things have happened in the Pacific Northwest with folks, um, and a lot of things could be prevented, and we just have to keep our eye out for that kind of stuff. Great. Um, not everything has to be a question, but the next person on stack was Tony. How's everybody doing? Uh, I guess my question is directed towards like who, whoever could answer. Maybe the guy on a uh, prompter. Uh, okay. When I voted for Barack Obama in uh, 2008 and he was elected, you know, I cried. You know, I was the happiest person in the world. But I must say that since then, some of his uh, actions have perplexed me, and I'm kind of disappointed. But uh, that being said, uh, I just get the feeling that within the African-American community, no matter what he does, the statistics seem to show that he has 85 to 95 percent uh, backing no matter what he does, because people just figure, hey, you know, he's uh, trying hard against the system and, you know, he's fighting the man or, you know, whatever. But my point is you talked about inclusion, and especially if he's elected again, how can we get in uh, a lot of numbers, African Americans, to even think about a revolution when they say, hey, Barack Obama will do what he has to do. Let him do it. Now, I'm not saying that I feel that way, but my point is how can Occupy, how can any any progressive movement pull African Americans over and away from Barack Obama when, uh, all right, all right, let's just say that, uh, imagine the power that he has when he talks to black audiences and he talks at black artists, just quoting Martin Luther King, you know. He's coming from 400 years of oppression and pain and all that. So how can, let's say, white people come and say, pay no attention to this guy. <laughs> Follow us. <laughs> so uh, basically, you know, I'm throwing a hot potato into your hand. <laughs> you <answer> that? <laughs> I love those hot potatoes. Can I do it? Yeah. Can I be first first with the hot potato? Woo! That's hot. Uh, okay, so um, we, we have in our database, um, which I invite everybody to, to visit, nvdatabase.swarthmore.edu, literally dozens of cases in which people rose up and threw out dictators nonviolently. But what they had to do before they were willing to do that on that mass basis was to try things that might work first that were more modest and less risky. And that only stands to reason, right? Why go all the way if you can get something, uh, something without taking such a great risk? And it was only after repeated rebuffs or getting a little bit, but not getting what they really wanted, and then getting a little bit, and not getting what they really wanted, that they finally became disillusioned. And they said, oh, okay, this, this person, this, uh, you know, th this, this person in the Oval Office, or this person in that country's equivalent of the Oval Office, is obviously not free to give us what we need, what our children need. We need public education in this country that really equips our student, our, our children, and they are not going to get it from Obama. They're not going to. He cannot deliver it even though I believe he wants to. He cannot. But until we go, uh, and until we campaign, that's the great advantage of campaigns, specifically over things that people of color want, that working class people want, that poor people want, and are rebuffed or only get a tiny bit enough to whet our appetites for more, then we're not going to be willing to take the big risk to go after the big power shift that really needs to happen. So I, I'm really grateful for your comment because you described so clearly what holds people back. There's a lot of hope. One reason we didn't have Occupy in 2008, I and mean, one reason the Tea Party got mad at Wall Street before the left did, 
in terms of visibility, right, was because there was this man of hope in the White House, right? Well, maybe he will take care of it. And it took a while to realize he's extremely, extremely limited. But it's going to take more time to realize how extremely limited he is because people, as, as you said so clearly, there are a lot of people who kind of hope. The Democrats so want you all. Right? The Democrats want you all this year to throw yourselves into the Obama campaign. The Democrats want the Occupy energy. I don't think they're going to get it. I hope. I pray. But anyway, that's what they want. Because over and over and over, people have gone for that. And our, what, what I see in reading these wonderful cases, these dozens of cases in the database, is people needed to exhaust the possibilities that they saw in the system before they gave up on the system. Some people are quick at that, some people take longer, some people take longer. But for a really mass movement, people need to exhaust those apparent possibilities and then say, okay, that's it. All right. Um, does anyone else want to respond to that? I did, yeah. Derek, you want to? Okay. Yeah. And I just want to acknowledge again how honored I am to sharing the stage with both of the people on the stage and also I'm honored to be even hearing these questions and um, and now having done that I'm going to go ahead and swear <laughs> um, and another way I put what you just said is um, what does it take for people to reach the fucking point um, um where it's like, okay, we've tried everything, tried, 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 well, fuck it, I go. And there's a great, um, a great poem by the Zen poet Hunan, which is, uh, die while you're alive and be absolutely dead, then do whatever you want, it's all good. <laughs> and one of the things that has, that means to me is, it's only when we give up on hope that we are able to really act. And what I mean by that is one of the smartest things the Nazis did was they made it so that every step of the way it was in the Jews' rational best interest to not resist. Do you want to get an ID card or do you want to resist and possibly get killed? Do you want to move to a ghetto or do you want to resist and possibly get killed? Do you want to get on a cattle car or do you want to resist and possibly get killed? And that's a tactic that is used constantly by those in power is they will continue to sort of ratchet up their repression. And at every step of the way, it's not in your interest to resist, so you don't until, until you're completely stuck. Okay, that's the first thing I want to say. Second thing I want to say is a frame that has really helped me to understand the Democrats is the whole good cop, bad cop thing with the, um, you know, with the police use all the time. And the Democrats are the good cops. Um, and the Republicans are the bad cops. And you know, it's like either either I can beat the crap out of you or my friend can come in here and be your friend and he'll be your friend as he still extracts the confession out of you that's going to send you to prison for the rest of your life. But neither one is, in your, is, is, your, is your friend. Um, environmentally, Obama has actually been worse than Bush. And um, Clinton accomplished things. It was, it's a great example. George Bush the first set out to, he said explicitly he wanted to destroy the endangered species act. And, oh, there's lots of, everybody got upset, especially the big New York environmental organizations. Yay, yeah, yay, yeah, that's terrible. We got to stop it with the money. And then Clint got in, and what he did is he defunded, he bureaucratically defunded any efforts to make critical habitat. He did far worse for the Endangered Species Act than, um, than George Bush the first could ever have dreamed, but he did it while he was feeling the pain. Okay, now that I've gone on that big, long lecture here, the other thing, and this is the most important thing I'm going to say, is I feel really uncomfortable as a white guy even answering your question. Um, because it's not up to me to say how, how, it's not up to me to actually say anything to people of color about oppression. Because my experience of oppression is about this big. Um, and so really what I would want to do is not a rhetorical question, is I would like to ask you, the questioner, 
what you think is the best idea for African Americans to disentangle themselves from um, the whole sort of Obama bot idea. <laughs> and so this is actually before, I would really like to do this. Before we go to the next question, I would really like it if, if the person who asked that question could, could, could tell us his idea, because I think that would be very helpful for me. That was a low blow. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, you know, I, I was at my uh, uh, family's house for Thanksgiving, and I started talking against Obama. I mean, I was literally almost punched in the face. You know, I realized that, that there might not have been anything rational that I could say that would overcome my family's pure emotions for having a black president. To be honest, I think at least half of them feel like, look, we didn't fuck this country up. He's doing the best he can. You know, and that's just coming from one area. You know what I'm saying? You know, so basically as far as they're concerned, it's nothing I can say to them. Nothing. So, you know, I... I spend time just just going down a whole lit uh, litany of things he's done. He's done this. He's done that. He won't he won't raise taxes on the rich. He won't do this. He won't do that. But when I look in people's faces, and I can say this because like I talk a lot to my people, when I look in their face, I can see that I'm just not reaching them. You know, maybe the pain like what you were saying of of the 400 years was so great and it's been so many messed up things happen you know like like maybe the whole slavery thing wasn't rational for uh thomas jefferson to write that all men are created equal but black people are two-thirds you know stuff like that you know so after all of that you know who am i to come along and tell the people well basically to snatch their hope because he still represents hope to them. And, you know, sometimes that's, you know, sometimes when I hear the far right start calling him the food stamp president and, 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 and stuff like that, then my emotions come up. And so even though I, I say he hasn't done this on a, a logical level, I say, but hold up. Look at what he's up against, you know. So now, you know, I'm actually fighting against myself, you know, I say, I say, I think that, that if I help him to get back in the office, he's not going to fight for what I want him to fight for. But when I watch MSNBC and CNN and I watch people just pile on him because he's black and talk about the black community, then that makes me say, whoa, you know what I'm saying? So that makes me less less eager to go jumping up in black people's faces and talking about Obama. I say, well, look, I don't know the answer because, because you know, there are some things said about him that are so terrible that, you know what I'm saying, I'm not going to waste my time trying to tell black people not to have that hope but they tell me look we know you're going to vote for him i say hold up no 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 but 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 you have to realize that if 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 a, a people have nothing else you know what i'm saying you know with the uh uh like five percent of the uh total wealth of the whole country and stuff like that if they have nothing else they have hope and that's what he gives them. And it's hard to take away hope from people. And, and, and that's all. Thank you. Good. You, Laura's got you on staff. Next person on the stack is Geraldo. Is that you? Hi, everyone. I'm from Swarthmore College. Um, this is my first um, meeting or like a physical affiliation with the Occupy movement, so I'm just really happy to be here. <laughs> um, so, um, I have 
I'm taking a documentary practicum right now, and um, my classmates are, uh, <coughs> sorry, I'm taking a documentary practicum at school, and my classmates are watching, they can't physically be here. Um, but I have a question from one of them who wants to ask, um, this is for all the panelists, uh, a letter from the Egyptian occupiers to occupy Wall Street urged against fetishizing nonviolence and against calling the revolution peaceful. Um, they're just wondering what you all had to, what you all had to say about this and the role of violence in the defense of space, in the defense of physical space. Thank you. Is 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 there a panelist who wants to uh, take the bait on that one? Physical <laughs> space. Derek. Yeah. Go ahead, Derek. I think I would be one of the last people in the world who engaged in fetishizing the violence. <laughs> um, I, I try, I believe I am, um, extremely pragmatic. And especially when it comes to the planet, because those who come after are not going to care about whether we were violent or non violent. They're not going to care about whether they can breathe the air and drink the water. And I don't believe in more words. And I also have a lot of believe in morality, but well, that's, that's, I don't believe that, that a strict adherence to non-violence is playing the wall high ground, which is what it is being written today, and then one out of the other is being in our And when there is systematic functional violence happening, the country is happening. I guess what I do want to, I guess what I really want to respond to is I just think tactically that one of the rules of asymmetric warfare that we should all keep in mind is that um, is that when guerrilla forces attempt to hold ground, they get slaughtered. And this was a big mistake that the Panthers made. They realized later that they should not have made armed compounds because they can't match the firepower. And what you need to do if you're going to have asymmetric warfare is you can't move. And this is where I believe that especially against the full power of the surveillance state and the full power of the military industrial prison complex, that at this stage in revolution, it is important for those who attempt to hold ground to be nonviolent for purely tactical reasons. Um, because once again, I mean, in World War II, the members of the various resistance movements all over all over Europe, one of the things they kept doing is they kept begging the um, the British and the, and, the, and the Soviets for artillery. And it was the stupidest thing they could ever do. Because as soon as you have a piece of artillery, you're tied to a piece of ground. And if you have, you know, 40 people in a couple of three cells, and you think you're going to go up against the full force of the German security state, you're crazy. So that's long and short of what I feel, is that if you're going to hold ground at this stage of the revolution, OK, I'm going to make an exception, which is, uh, <laughs> the exception that I, I want to say explicitly is that um, the American Indian Movement um, was very great in some ways and had some huge problems, huge, huge problems, including sort of a cult of masculinity. Um, but I think that among indigenous peoples, there's a whole other question about holding ground. And I, when I say this, I just want to make clear that I'm not saying anything against um, the American Indian Movement and people who took up weapons in defense of the people on Pine Ridge. I just want to, I, I want to set that out. But having, having said that, I just I, I want to say again, oh, I want to say one more thing too, which is when it does come to military resistance, um, I think it's desperately important for white people not to yet again put people of color on the front lines. I just need to, to add that to the whole mix. Uh, okay, so that's that's sort of my uh, excuse me, honey, or shotgun approach to that question. Okay. It's really interesting, Derek. I think you're up in my head um, because the example I was actually going to use was Pine Ridge and the American Indian Movement because um, to 
Oops. Two instances I can. I, well, I, I broke the mic. I did something to the mic. But two instances that, that come out of that are, are two people. One is dead and one is in prison. Um, is Anna Mae Akwash is dead and Leonard Peltier is in prison um, for a shootout. And I, I suggest anyone watch the, the documentary shoot um, Incident at Ogala, um, which really talks about the FBI repression and um, how it comes to play and stuff like that. Um, especially being accused of a crime that you didn't commit um, here in Philadelphia. You know, we can look at Mumia. There's many cases, many cases of, um, of, of governmental oppression and finding scapegoats. And until we have a mass movement, we're not going to have that mass change like they saw and they see. Um, and, and, <laughs> and I, too, I think it would be funny to say fetishize um, anything, but especially nonviolence. And I think that it's apples and oranges. We're not in that kind of governmental oppression and, and um, circumstances. And we don't have a mass movement. We don't have the people behind us. And I think in order to create that change, we have to get the mindset. Um, the, the very eloquent gentleman spoke a moment ago about um, Barack Obama and the African American community. If we can't convince the African American community to not vote for Obama, how are we going to start making those political changes that we want to and getting people to find that common ground in order to be willing to pick up arms um, for each other? And I think that that's one of the biggest kind of struggles that we have is just finding that common ground to be able to create that change. And until we actually have a mass movement, then I think we're going to have a mass slaughter if we start picking up arms. And I look at, um, as a history teacher, I look at instances like the American Indian Movement, the Black Panthers, um, countless other you know instances that have happened. I look at the women up on, you know, the grandmas up on Big Mountain and how they've been treated and what has happened and stuff like that. And, um, you know, power by a, by a few is not going to change something and picking up just a couple arms. Um, when, uh, several years ago, my husband and I went to South Africa, and um, for those of you that don't know, my husband is African American. I am, I am not. Um, she knows that. Um, and so it was a really interesting experience. We went to um, some friends of our friend that we were visiting, and we went to this compound, and they had to add extra security that night because Americans were in their compound. And they do all the security themselves. And it was this real eye-opener because we saw on one side this older generation that was out patrolling, you know, um, the compound with weapons and all that, um, kind of afraid of us and, and not sure, you know, about having Americans around and stuff like that. But then all the younger folks all came to meet us because we were American. And it was this really interesting um, conversation we had. Not to, not to mention they all thought we knew Will Smith because we lived in Philadelphia. Um, and they were all huge Usher fans. Um, very odd. But it was this, 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 this dichotomy of these, these mindsets and these generations. Um, and one who, who severely went through apartheid and one that, you know, have come of age outside of apartheid. Um, the formal version of apartheid because it was still a very racially um, split country and you can you can definitely see the effects of apartheid everywhere and as a as a history teacher then you know we ended up talking a lot about the you know civil rights movement here in the United States and you know when we were at the apartheid museum in South Africa looking at the amount of, of, of representation of, of bodies of people who died um, is, is massive and, and, and even like even you know gazillion times more massive than what happened here in the civil rights movement and you can you could see you know how close this country came for, to that to that next edge um, and I think that when we when we're driven over that that edge like um, George and others have spoken about that we're going to see that need to, to up the ante and people are going to have to feel um, that loss, and and I was so glad that, that Derek again in my head mentioned about um, the worst environmental president was Bill Clinton. Um, it was just amazing how we have these different mindsets in our own minds of, of oh you know oh Democrats they suck oh but Republicans really really suck um, and it, they really kind of equally suck and, <laughs> and stuff like that. And it's very simple, but until we all see that we're pushed over that edge. Um, I don't think we can really compare ourselves to Egypt, um, and I don't really think that we should try to.
Do you want to say something? Yeah, I, I could just add something more on this uh, common ground uh, that I, I do feel is emerging tonight, actually. Um, and I want to, you know, bounce off Kathy in a way. Uh, because another source of common ground is information that we now have that previous movements didn't have. For example, Erica Shenoweth and Maria Stephen have done a study of attempts at regime change. They created a database 1900 to 2006. They found 323 cases in which people tried to do a regime change. And the wonderful thing about that is a lot of accomplishment was done. A lot of regimes got changed. Anti-colonial struggles, there were a number that won, and so on and so on. But they were also curious about, well, what's the relative efficacy of violent struggles as compared with nonviolent struggles? What they found was that the armed struggles that overthrew governments uh, were able to do it 23% of the time. That is, out of the 100% of their... Uh, efforts, the armed struggle movement's efforts, in 23% of the cases, they actually won. So they thought, well, how did the nonviolent movements do? They found that in the nonviolent movements that were out to overthrow dictators um, and, and regimes, 53% won. That is, that the movements that chose nonviolent means were actually twice as effective at overthrowing regimes than the movements that chose armed struggle. Now that's new information. Who, you know, who, who did that before? Who knew from a pragmatic point of view? And I know there's a lot of pragmatism both in Derek and, and Kathy uh, wanting to do the thing that's going to be most effective. Who knew that pragmatically you double your chances against a military dictatorship? You double the chances against those torturers who are running your government if you choose nonviolent means. That's news. And that supports us to reach for a common, a common struggle. Because that, in my boyhood, in my young adulthood, in discussions with revolutionaries all over the world, nobody knew that kind of thing. And it was, it was you know, decision by decision in country after country. But now we know it. Now the burden of proof needs to be for those who argue for only half the chance of winning as compared with those who argue. But of course there are no guarantees, right? Even the nonviolent way was only 53% effective. But who wouldn't rather try your chances with 53% than with 26%? So I believe that builds a huge amount of common ground with so many people in our society who are sick and tired of the existing situation, but who have a lot of difficulty jumping into a struggle that that might mean uh, uh, killing people and you know ex exposing their children to greater danger. So, uh, and I just also want to appreciate my panelists. I think it has been and the questions, the depth of the questions. I think we've had quite an evening. Thank you. Uh, thank you as well. Um, it's currently 9 o'clock, but I also feel that there seems to be a lot of energy in the room about the things that we're talking about. So I'd actually like to see a straw poll if people would like to continue for another 15 minutes or end now. So if you'd like to continue, raise your hand. All right. Very good. At what time? I, well, 9.20 is a good ending point. Uh, but raise your hand. Sorry, we didn't finish that. Raise your hand if you'd like to end now. Oh, nobody. <laughs> One person. All right, good. Um, so we have three more people on the stack, but I also feel like there might be some feeling of urgency amongst folks to respond to something that was just said from George. I'm wondering if there is, if we'd want to pursue that. Yeah, you'd like to speak? Just really quickly, um, my name is Uda, and um, I'm coming from an evangelical Christian perspective, and I've been a, a Christian pacifist since I was three in New York City, which is not an especially easy path. Um, I, I'm really <coughs> tired of being put on the front line, um, and, and um, but I, 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 I'm trying to follow Jesus, and I'm really imp impressed with this call 
to be willing to lay down your life for people, and I'm not really good at that, and not to kill people. Um, it's the question that we ask of every person who signed up for the Nazi party, ultimately, and signed up for the Luftwaffe squad. Why don't you just take the chance of saying, no, I'm not going to do this. I'm willing to go to prison. I'm willing to die, whatever. Many, many of those people in Nazi Germany who were told to do something that was illegal under, under, under arms and didn't do it were released from, from, from having to, to accomplish the thing that was, was illegal, wrong, immoral, violating somebody else. They just were not put to the test, ultimately. They, put, they were put to the test, but they were not, not given the consequence that they thought they were going to receive. And there, there, are, there are communities of people who live in this country to this day um, who said no to, to, um, to fighting for regimes. I can't, I can't kill somebody for regime change. I've already got flame and P PTSD. It comes from killing people in general more than it comes from seeing people getting killed or getting bounced around yourself. I can't do it. I won't do it. And I want people to realize that when people do, do this killing for a purpose at some point, at some point, maybe it's a, a throwing a rock for, through a window first, but ultimately it can get to something is first besides people or something is first besides God, I'm willing to kill. At that point, we have a problem because once the regime has changed, you've got problems with how to have a dialogue that doesn't result in people doing fairly violent things to get their points across. And everybody is sure that they're, they're very, very ju justified. They were all against the regime change. I mean, they're all against the regime to begin with. So they've now proved their moral, moral high ground by, by winning. What's the next step? Years and years of, 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 of uh, you know, confrontations. We do need to have, though, those, those alternate forms of those alternate structures in place. Because it's going to fall apart one way or the other. And it doesn't have to fall apart through violence. It can just fall apart through food insecurity or mistakes, whatever. That needs to be in place. And the way to have good dialogue on an ongoing basis, that, that's something that we're all working on. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so uh, if I, I realize we, we have a number of people in the room who haven't gotten on stack and maybe have something to say. If that's true for you, could you raise your hand? OK. So we want to hear these voices. Um, John had already been on stack, so I want to go to him next. Then I'm going to go to Amanda. And then uh, I didn't get everyone's ha name. but And since we are at crunch for time, try to keep it to like a minute or less. Hello. Um I want to know, where did you get the fact that um, the Panthers failed because of violence? Um, they didn't fail because of violence. They failed because they were coin and pro, pro and tell. And they also failed because of the community and, and the people that infiltrated their movement. So that was just a correction. And two, um, the violent uprisings in Haiti that, um, and the slave revolts, those were violent movements that did succeed. So we always talk about how violent movements fail. Let's talk about the ones that have succeeded. Thank you. Um, Amanda? Hi, everybody. I'm Amanda. Um, so my current thoughts and responses right now are triggered by um, both the statistics that George was just talking about and also my recent trip to North Belfast, which was about a week ago, um, and was one of the most intense violent, amazing places I've ever been in my entire life. Um, and I guess my, and, and I'm so sorry, I don't remember your Uda, name. Uda. Your, right, your comments, Uda, about um, concerns about violence and concerns about arms and things of this nature. I guess I feel like the biggest thing that I took away from being in Bel Belfast and talking to a bunch of ex and current IRA members and Republican members um, over there was that I don't have the right to judge anyone's thoughts on their necessity of action to defend themselves, their family, their community, and things of this nature. And I also 
think that um, regard to Zach's statements about, and, and Zach and Kathy and Derek, Derek's dialogue on diversity of tactics, I think that there is no way that we will win, whatever that means, without respecting each other's diversity of tactics. And I think that Zach's point about um, conversation and communication and respect, and Kathy's point about um, all tactics being necessary at a point to a point, and, and Derek's point about um, them being important as long as there is a strategic tactical target. Those are all really important things that I hope everyone is thinking about here because I had lots of thoughts about violent resistance and about arms prior to going to Belfast. And the conversations I had with individuals who have grown up in armed resistance and are now in their 30s and um, talk about what the peace process wasn't and what it was in Ireland was incredibly um, radicalizing for me in like what a diversity of tactics really means in practice versus when we sit and theorize about it. And I think that statistics are great to an end, but in practice they sometimes don't mean anything. And not to negate what you were just saying, George, but that um, I just hope that we come away from this thinking a lot more broadly about people's personal experiences and cultures and where they come from, because I think that's even more important than a diversity of tactics, is me and you understanding why I think I should be doing what I'm doing and what this will accomplish to further my survival and to further the survival of my community and to further the survival of my family, because I think that's even more important than tactics, is intent and purpose. Why am I doing what I'm doing? Why am I saying what I'm saying? Why do I feel like you're being oppressive to me right now or you are in solidarity with me? I think those conversations are almost equally as, if not more important, than tactics. Thank you. So, um, just so everyone knows, I, I'm kind of letting this go a little bit because I feel like, uh, although we've had some really amazing questions, I think one of the things that, that happened is I kind of feel like as a facilitator, like the, the panel and everyone in the room kind of seemed to be converging on a sort of um, consensus, but it wasn't really a real consensus because there's, there's actually a lot of disagreement in the room that we never actually addressed. So I'm kind of just allowing that to be teased out right now. Um, I'm wondering if any of the panelists or people in the room have direct responses to the line of conversation that we're headed on right now. Okay, so I had Jeremy over there. I'll come back to Lucy, and we'll see where we go from there. All right, um, I'll be real brief. I just want to address two things that um, I think perspectives that were not uh, brought up that I think are important to me. Uh, the first is, well, except there's always going to be uh, diversity of people in movements, especially mass movements, I think as an anarchist, one of the most uh, crucial parts of the theory has been uh, an insistence that atheism is an important part in how humans can progress. So I think that's something, I, I don't accept a, a faith-based solution, um, even though I will work with people as comrades where, our, where we intersect. And I don't want to see that lost on the left, so I think that people who are atheists should continue to express that. And I also have been a little troubled by how um, the black box tactic has been presented. Um, I actually absolutely do agree there's room for a strategic improvement. Um, I just think it's troubling that it seems to be counterposed to being involved in mass movements, because most people I know um, who have supported it have done a lot of other things, and they've been involved in various other ways. And I think it also is not, I mean, it seems like it's represented often as just window smashing, but I think there's a variety of ways it's allowed protests to be militant or it's protected people, and I think it has future applications. Um, and I just wanted to throw that out there. Can I respond to that? Um, I've marched in, in participating in many black black actions. I was talking just specifically um, about the merging of tactics together at the same time. And I apologize if it seemed that I felt that every black black tactic doesn't work. Um, I just don't think they should be at the same time. And, and they should be strategic. <laughs> <laughs> That's the watchword of today. So here comes Lucy. Um, I mean, I think that, that one thing of, that is really strategic is being what you're trying to engender, that the means engender the ends, and having clarity about means engendering the ends. Um, and, and one of the things that I found incredibly inspiring about the Occupy encampment 
um, is that it was it was an example, a de demonstration of an alternative, a very powerful demonstration of an alternative, and the way that people who came were treated. I mean, from from the direct democracy to how people were greeted, um, and and I think that um, one of the teachers that has taught me a lot, and and this is something that I've learned just from sort of experimentally, and I. And I'm not, and I want to be really clear that I'm not rigid. Um, but I think that it's really true. Um, this is something from Naomi Span. This is a quote that she quotes. Um, the flower is contained within the seed. If a certain flower is desired, then that particular seed must be planted. Condemnation does not produce reconciliation. Compassion never springs forth from judgment. Peace is not the fruit of war. And so I think that the way, the, the conditions of our heart matter in what we do and the conditions of how we treat one another. And it doesn't mean that I think that there is one way. I think that it's very important to experiment because I think that that's the only way to find it. But I think that you, that, that the conditions of our heart really, really do matter. And I, and I also, the other thing that she said a lot is, um, the saddest thing is that I will do what you have done to me. And that is the 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 the, um, the the horrible prison of oppression is that we are oppressed and then we do it again. And I think that we need if it's going to stop, we have to stop it, and it begins with our hearts. Thank you. Um, yeah, Derek, go ahead. I don't think, I think that one of the problems with the English language is that we only have one word for violence. And I think it's not really fair to, I'm not saying we did this, but I, I have heard this a lot where uh, I don't think that a woman killing a rapist is her oppressing him. I think that. There is a big difference between violence and counter-violence, or there's a big difference between the oppression of the state and those who are resisting it. And so far as our hearts, well, this might not make it very popular, but I think hate is a righteous emotion. And a big difference is, I mean, I am full of hate and love and joy and sorrow. And I think it's just as appropriate to hate someone who has done something hateful as it is to not hate someone who has not done something hateful. And I don't want to... And the most important thing, I think, is that there's a line by a friend of mine that I just love, which is the task of an activist is not to navigate systems of oppressive authority with as much personal integrity as possible. The task of an activist is to take down the systems of oppressive authority. And so, for me, I don't so much... I mean... I don't find... I, I, I think that... Uh, I guess that's all. I'm just going to do now. Um, so yeah, I just I just think we need to make a distinction. There's a problem with the language that, that to, to presume that not did this. I think it's a mistake with the language to presume that all forms of violence are equal. And that once again, there's a big distinction um, with people fighting back against oppression, which doesn't mean that it doesn't traumatize and traumatize us around, but we still. There's a great line by Chekhov. Somebody said to him that he wanted to write a story. Some young writer said, I want to write a story, but I don't know what to write about. Okay. And Chekhov said, what I want you to do is write a story about someone who squeezes every drop of slave blood out of themselves. And I think that what we do, how we respond to the oppression, the place I would totally agree with you is I think what we need to do is to squeeze every drop of slave blood out of ourselves. And I don't think we should have reactive violence. I don't think we should have reactive nonviolence. I think what we should do is examine our circumstances 
and examine our hearts to figure out what is appropriate, and then to move from there. Which maybe we're saying the same thing. Maybe we're not. That was a really good point. Um, we only have a couple minutes left to be in this room. I'm wondering if, if people feel an, if anyone feels a burning desire to respond to what's being said now. We have a couple, a couple hands. So I, I promised Stephen in the back we'd come back to his question. So we'll we'll hear Stephen, and then I think we might we might have to wrap up. I was going to ask something that had to do with campaigns, but um, what I'm feeling more directly right now is to speak to uh, the question around atheism and theism. Because that's as much in this room, and and in part a lot of the the same questions around violence, nonviolence. It divides us along these lines, right? And I, I'm a youth minister in this building with the Quakers. I work with middle schoolers. I've done things with the National Council of Churches. I've been involved. Um, and I, I think I agree with you more than, than you would uh, more than you would guess. I don't need you to believe in God. I don't believe that we're going to reach some final solution based on my theology or anybody else's. Um, I think I think a lot of what we're we're here wrestling with. Uh, I'm losing that. <laughs> um, you got it. I need you to believe in me. I don't need you to believe in God. I need you to believe in the feeling that we have when we're all having our fingers in the air and believe that that is bigger than the sum of its parts and believe in the energy that comes when we're marching step by step in step with one another. Um, just as... Just as Religions have perpetrated some of the most atrocious acts in the history of mankind and been the root of so many causes of evil. I would also tell you that those religions are human institutions built up around um, a power that humans thought they could tap into and claim as their authority and assert and oppress others by using. And that is not what I call religion. And that's and so I just I hope we we can distinguish. Um, in the languages that are going on here, um, I think a lot of the rhetoric gets conflated sometimes, and, and I just want to try and, and keep that distinction in our hearts and, and keep the connections established between us. Thank you so much. I feel like a talk show host running around with the microphone around the audience. It's really fun. I recommend doing this. Um, thank you all so much for coming tonight. This was wonderful. Um, I really valued this conversation, and even though I didn't necessarily come to the end, I think that's fine. There is no end. This is an ongoing, you know, discussion and debate that, you know, we have to continue, and I think it's up to all of you to continue it, to create spaces like this for this kind of conversation to occur and other conversations about strategy. Um, but I, summing up, I just want to reflect what Stephen just said about, you know, you don't have to believe what I believe, but you do have to believe in me, and I think... There's something really important about what we're doing here um, because, you know, we don't all agree, you know. We, we, we don't all agree, and, and, but at the same time, we're part of something bigger than ourselves together, and we're, and we're all in that thing. So I think it's really important that we continue to figure out how, how do we critically engage with one another? How do we, you know, continue to be a part of a movement with people who we totally disagree with on tactics, on strategy? You know, and and Occupy in Philly has been struggling with that practice. You know, so I think this is a really good conversation to help us, you know, think about that more. How do we how do we continue to coexist with people who, you know, are part of a movement with us, but at the same time who we just flat out disagree on on tactics and strategy. Um, so anyway, thank you all for coming. This was great, and we'll see you next week. I think Michael's going to make an announcement about next week's event. Um, thanks to Alex for your good work tonight. <laughs>talk show hosts like you so, uh, with guests like these so thank you George and Kathy and Derek and all our impromptu panelists and, and questioners and commentators etc um, so I think this was live stream and I think more video is going to be available online if folks didn't catch it all the conversation will continue of course 
online, in our lives, in the streets, in the bars. Yes, thanks. <clears throat> and um, and uh, a couple of announcements. <laughs> Next week, as mentioned, will be the story session. Um, and so I hope to see a bunch of you here and, and bring your friends. We'll find space somewhere. Um, look at close space. And then uh, two quick announcements. One is this week, March 1st, some of y'all already know there's going to be a citywide walkout around education. Education is a right SOS Save Our Schools, and that'll be at Temple at Penn. There's a 1 p.m. rally. Where's the rally? Anyone? On the campus. Okay. On, the, on campuses, and you can find this stuff online. But that's on uh, Thursday, March 1st. And then the Earthquake or Action Team, who is known to some of you, if not all of you, waging a campaign around um, to stop mountaintop removal coal mining. There'll be a kickoff of a new phase of that campaign happening Wednesday, which is two days from now. Um, and that'll be midday, 11.30 to 1 in this room. And it's, um, it's a Green Your Money campaign uh, that will be happening at the same time as a march from Philly to Pittsburgh to call on PNC Bank to divest from mountaintop removal coal mining. Pardon me? Non training. The non-violent the non uh, the nonviolent warrior training, as mentioned, March 10th. There's still room in that training. Um, you can find out about it online on the Facebook page, etc. cetera. And uh, once again, it's not just for dyed-in-the-wool, card-carrying pacifists, but for everyone who wants to explore this stuff. And that's a training with training for change. And we'll take contributions for it if you want. Right, that too. Um, and I think that's about it, other than to say one more thank you to our, our panelists, to the organizers, and to the tech team. Thank you, Derek. Thank you, Derek. Bye, Derek. See you again soon. <laughs>